Good day, listeners. Welcome to this edition of the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. We're so glad to have you here with us. My name is Jonathan, and we actually have a special guest on the line with us. We have Meg Wilson with us. So, Meg, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jonathan. Happy to be here. Yeah, and and uh, you're. Tell me if I'm wrong. You're up in the Northwest, is that right? Correct. Yeah, just okay. across the river from Portland, Oregon. Okay. Yeah. So you you get to experience all the the joys and sorrows of the northwest part of the country, right? I always tell people, I say, you know what? When the sun is out in the Pacific Northwest, there's no place like it on Earth. <laughs> but, but so much of the time, I'm like, it's even beautiful when it's gray. But man, when the sun comes out, it's spectacular. Yeah, we you really you don't realize how many people live here until the sun comes out. <laughs> exactly. Everybody uh, goes outside, right? Well, we are glad to have you with us, and we're, we're going to spend some time with you talking about, um, about wives and kind of the journey that wives need to go on when it comes to uh, wor working through sexual betrayal and trauma. But before we do that, um, I would just like you to be able to share uh, a little bit about yourself, maybe just kind of uh, how did you come to be in this space of ministry, and then um, uh, just just let our listeners kind of know who you are. Give us a little bit of a flavor of, of Meg. Okay. Well, <clears throat> right now I'm Meg with a froggy voice, so pardon that. I, gosh, I, let's see. Should I say I woke up one day and decided I'd like to be the poster child for sexual addiction. That should get a laugh. Yeah. Um, so, no, I, gosh, 17 years ago, my husband came and shared about his secret life and his addiction to porn and, and everything changed in a, in a few short moments. And um, if it's too long of a story to, to um, tell all the details, but I know there are so many women who've been in that same situation. So I entered into a community that I didn't even realize and uh, began looking for support and help and, and, um, and then just through, through the process of doing my own work through counseling and groups, ended up leading groups and ended up writing the book, Hope After Betrayal, which came out in 2007. Then um, thought, oh, I'm going to take a break. I, maybe I'm done with this. And God had a sense of humor and really made it clear that the next step was a nonprofit. And so I had my mom, Moses moment and thought, oh, I don't, I I could tell you, oh God, all the reasons why I can't run a nonprofit. And he patiently, you know, brought people into my life that said, you know, this is, this is what your board is for. This is, this is how this all works. And literally there were runway lights and I just had to follow the lights. I just had to stay within the, the parameters that God laid out. And, and six years later, Hope After Betrayal is, is a thriving nonprofit. And we are here dedicated to um, help women who, uh, have been betrayed by their husband's sexual mm -hmm. brokenness, whether that's an affair or, you know, uh, pornography. And the, the, the second book, the revised and expanded edition just came out, which is crazy to think. It's been over 10 years since the first book came out. And mm -hmm. so it's been exciting to see how God takes that, which the en enemy intended for evil and uses it for good. Cause that's right. really been the journey, not only to healing, but then, God had me use what all that stuff that he did for me to share that with other women who need it. So it's, it's crazy. If he had told me 15 years ago that I would be doing this, I probably would have, um, yeah, I would have run <laughs> farther than Jonah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's always interesting to me. I, it's a, it's a rare, rare, rare thing when I meet somebody who's been called into this space of ministry without having a personal backstory. Yeah. Um, I've met, less than a handful that that's the case, but that's like, that's a whole different kind of calling. But most people that I meet that have been called into the space of ministry have a backstory. And, and I think that's just, to me, that's just another testimony of the grace of God that I never would have thought, like, again, if you told me 25 years ago, hey, you're going to be doing what you're doing, I would not have connected that with God's grace. I would have said, man, that sounds like punishment. You want me to be in that space of ministry doing that? That sounds too hard. I mean, but having come through my own recovery and having learned that, guess what? I actually belong in that tribe. <laughs> Those are my people. Um, then I realized for God then to take that next step and say, now I want you 
to be an agent of reconciliation, an agent of recovery and restoration in other people's lives. When I look at the, my own history and go, God, do you realize the? you do know who I am, right? I mean, I'm, I'm the rebellious, broken, sinful, you know, outcast. What are you thinking? And so I just love the way that God is all about redemption. And I'd love for you to talk about that because there's a different side of it that you're coming to it from. You know, I come through it, I come to it in, in the side that your husband was on. I come to it from the side of the one who's uh, committing the offenses that are damaging my, my wife. Talk about it now from what that community and healing process looks like for a betrayed spouse, because I think there's a different kind of burden that mm-hmm. th- those who have been betrayed carry from the one who has been doing the betraying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I liken it to you and your spouse have been in the same car accident, but um, you weren't driving the car <laughs> and you have completely different injuries. So mm-hmm. he's, he's been life flighted off to do work on his brain injury. And now you have to go and work on your internal injuries so I like that analogy because so often as wives, we want to help our husbands. We want to encourage them. Some of us even want to micromanage what they're doing, but um, that that's, takes away from the, the healing that we need to do. Mm-hmm. So um, I think, it, and in the beginning, it's easy to say, oh yeah, that's my husband did this, this, and this, and he's, this, he's, the, he's the bad guy and I'm the innocent victim. And, you know, that feels pretty comfortable for a while, but God didn't let me stay there. He, he's like, you know, the more I did my work, he's like, there's, there's some things here for you, Meg. Not that I did anything to cause the choices of another person. That's not at all what I'm saying. But I, I had responsibility on how to, how to respond to what happened, how to, how to live in the truth when you're in a situation where someone else is not living in the truth. And so there was, a, there was a whole host of things that God had to show me about who I needed to, to be in, in him. So what, I, what I'm hearing you say and what I hear from so many other wives who've gone through this process is, is that in a similar way that recovery is often broken down into stages, I'm hearing you, it sounds like there's even stages to the healing that a wife needs to go through. Can you help us just... Help us with just that first stage. How does a wife get, let's say, beyond the idea of what you were saying of like, hey, this is his problem. I don't need to deal with anything. And so once he gets quote unquote fixed, everything will be good. How do you, how do you get into even that first stage of just kind of embracing the mess and embracing the pain and just even taking that step? How do you help? How did you do it? And then also, how do you help wives take that step into the kind of the first stage of healing? Yeah, I think that you know. Well, the first stage is shock. I think shock, mm-hmm. and and then when you then you enter into kind of the stage we're talking about. And one of the things we do, we, I do just a twelve week class for gals, and and so obviously you're not going to be healed in twelve weeks. So I I liken it to the ER. I guess I like my medical metaphors. And so we're just trying to get them stable, stop the bleeding. So I tell the women up front, this class is for you and you're going to want to talk about what your husband did, but you know what? We're not, I may interrupt you because we're, I just don't want you to waste any of this time that's for you on some place where we have no control. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the first thing is, is, you know, peeling the fingers back, getting the death grip off of their husband, their marriage their whatever it is their dreams we we're holding on to things that we feel are slipping away and truthfully there are things that will die there are things that will that will we won't get back and so um it's it has to be a really gentle and loving process so that's so having a safe place with other women and hearing that okay well i'm not crazy number one for feeling the way i feel and then number two to have someone you know the facilitators who've who've walked that path say, you're, you're going to get through this. Mm-hmm. That's, that's so yeah. helpful. And I think I, I actually, I love the medical analogies. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of parallels, you know, we'd even use that in recovery a lot of times, you know, in terms of, you, you know, you broke your leg and you got to do all this kind of stuff. But um, w- one of the things that I, I hear also in a lot of uh, trauma work is 
in, in many ways, the process that a wife has to go through in healing is very similar to grieving, is it not? Yeah, so, absolutely. So break that down for our listeners of like, what does the grief process look like as it pertains to a wife healing from, in, very, in a very real way, kind of a death that has occurred in her life on an emotional level? Yeah, absolutely. It, it is very much like a death. And we talk about grieving. And, and here's, the, here's the tricky part about grieving is it's, even though you have the six stages of grieving all beautifully, you know, laid out for us by people smarter than me, it's not a linear or clean process. So today I might be in the anger stage. Tomorrow I might be in the, the bargaining stage. So part of it is just um, understanding that we, we are – it is very much like grief. It comes in waves. It comes in stages. And so just letting people know that these are some of the stages. This is what it looks like. So, you know, we write an anger letter because at some point, even if it's not today, at some point you're going to have to process appropriately anger when someone has lied to you for years, potentially put your, your health and life at, at risk. And anger is an appropriate response. So mm-hmm. then we, you know, we talk about, okay, in our anger, do not sin. What does that look like? So, you know, and then the bargaining piece that if that's where we try to tie our behavior to their behavior. So we really try to avoid that. Like you, there's nothing you can do. You could have been the most beautiful, the most perfect wife and your husband would have still made those choices. So that doesn't feel true. And at first it took several people, it took several people to have to tell me that this wasn't my fault. The, The enemy very much, wants to whisper that it's that you weren't kind enough, small enough, big enough, beautiful, whatever, fill in the blank. Or I've had women tie their poor choices in the past and say, Oh, God's punishing me. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Oh no, 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 no. So, so we, we want to, we spend a lot of time with lies versus truth and um, making sure that those truths are backed up with scripture because there's a lot of lies that we get fed. Yeah, and I, I'd love to camp there for a little bit because, you know, I see this, we see this happen a lot of times in recovery too, where uh, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance that goes on, where there's, you know, there's the truth of scripture. There's also the truth of this idea that, oh, actually, you were not the cause of your husband's behavior. But yet, then there's the very real emotion that seems to contradict those things. And so how do you help how do you help wives see that there can be things that are real in our experience but that there's still truths that are greater than even what is real in our experience because I think that's a very difficult place to be because the emotion can be so powerful that it can feel like nothing could be more true than what I am feeling right now and then you're telling me it's not my fault. But it absolutely feels like if I had been prettier, more available sexually, if I had been any number of things, Mm -hmm. he would have never done this. So walk us through how you help women kind of navigate this really difficult battle that's going on within them. Well, that is the power of the truth. That is the power of the truth setting you free. And um, because it gets even more convoluted and more complicated when you actually have a husband communicating to his wife that it was her fault. Right. So you, in other words, so you're basically taking what felt true to her and what was her world for so long and, and saying now you have, you're, you're in an alternate universe in some ways. That's why it has to be, it has to be rooted and grounded in scripture and also in understanding how I, I, going back to our medical understanding how the brain works what how the addiction works in in a in the heart of any person who's who's trapped by addiction and then helping her to grab onto those those bigger universal truths getting it out of her world and and saying you know when god said you know, you're perfectly wonderfully made. There's no, uh, there's no footnote with your name <laughs> that says you don't call. You know that that's right. we're all fearfully and wonderfully made. So just getting getting her, her rooted and grounded in in those foundational truths would sound really basic. But then also helping her understand. Well, why would my husband say that if it wasn't true? Well, let me explain to you what's going on. What what's going on in the, the mind of an addict, 
And mm -hmm. so what he's saying, he probably even believes it's true, but this is, this is the thing that he's dealing with in his life. So we kind of go through the forensics of the addictive root, the addictive mindset. Most, I, I don't think I've met a, a husband yet for whom this didn't start before they were ever married. So that's, mm -hmm. if they can get to that root of the first time they, they were either abused or saw pornography or whatever that inciting incident is, then that, if they can see that, then they can say, oh yeah, this, this started before he ever knew you, which means no matter who he married, this would have happened. So just really, it's the power of the truth and, and really getting them out of the smoke and mirrors of emotion. The emotions are, are valuable, but they are not the truth. So right. important. Let, to let's talk also about the, so obviously truth is essential for being able to kind of provide a compass and an anchor, a reference point when, when emotions are swirling and when everything in your life is chaotic. But let's also talk about the value of healthy community for a woman who is seeking to heal from this. Because we see a lot of times the, 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 the danger of a woman kind of drifting off into a secluded state of aloneness where her connections with her, her girlfriends become superficial and, you know, she gives all the spiritual platitudes of God's good, I've forgiven him, you know, kind of playing the role <laughs> while inwardly she's kind of, she's still dying from the reality of, of what's happened to her. So talk about how you create an invitational environment for women to step into, because again, I can imagine how, how uh, threatening that can feel because, like you said, you're in a car wreck that you didn't cause and you st you're the one that's having internal bleeding. And I heard one woman describe it this way when she talked about have, you know, feeling the need to join a group of women. She felt like she was now experiencing a double shame. Like, okay, I have the original shame of discovering that my husband has betrayed me in this way, and now you want me to step into a group where I'm having to admit I need healing? Mm -hmm. That feels like another shame that's been put on me. So, so talk about community and the, the value of it, and how do you help women you know, connect in, in a group? Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you know, Jonathan, there's two, two things, two powerful tools that you just mentioned in that whole thing. One to, that the enemy has, one is to isolate. And the second one is shame. So, cause shame, shame causes you to isolate. So that's it. If, if, if the woman is feeling shame, then she is going to isolate. That's why we do just, uh, that's why we do just the 12 week group, even though we know they need longer. And at the end of 12 weeks, pretty much in order to graduate, they have to have a next step, whether that's counseling or another group or whatever. But in the beginning, they don't want to commit to much. I think your group is like six weeks. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I see the wisdom in that because you just you just want to you want her to stick her toe in and discover what you and I already know, and that is in a safe environment with other people who get it, healing can happen. And that's it's when women come in the first couple weeks, their heads down, a lot of tears, they don't talk much, but boy, once once they all share their stories, it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. Now we're all on the same page. That's why we we don't add anyone after that occurs. Because now they all know each other's stories, so any fears of confidentiality, they know they all, you know, they all want that, and um, that's when the group really starts rolling. I feel like is once they've all shared their story, they've said it out loud, many for the first time, and so that brings it into the light of day. And then hearing other women's story, everybody's story, even though they're all different, there's usually one thing in everybody's story that you think, oh yeah, I could have said that. And so it's, it's huge. And, you know, it's interesting. These, I started doing groups in our church. And when I thought I was taking a break, I came to a, a, an office building here in Vancouver that's run by a Christian um, business owner. And he donates all the space to Christian nonprofits. And I walked in and I saw this training room. And it was just like a light bulb that said, we've got to get women out of any one church and into this neutral Mm -hmm. location because of exactly what you're talking about the shame factor and even though we know there's it's not true there's nothing to be ashamed of that that's a that feels really real and true in the beginning so yeah well, and, 
And you're saying some things here that I think I would even say, okay, kind of fast forwarding if there's, if restoration is going on in your relationship and things are starting to move in that direction. I would love the husbands to hear this because I've, I've, it's such a simple thing. And yet so many men miss that, miss this. And that is that I've heard from so many women and so many wives that the one thing that they want more than anything is to be known and understood and this, the way that most women feel known and understood is when they feel heard. Yeah. And I'm like, man, how can we guys be so thick in the head that it's like such a simple thing, and yet we get so absorbed in our own addiction and our own self-centeredness that we don't realize that we have such a, a power to draw our wives in if we're willing to listen and I think that's the power of group in any setting, whether it's for recovery or for a wife healing, is there such power in being able to feel like you've been fully heard, like not just pacified or not just kind of like half, half attention, but no, you really know my story and you're, you're interested and you care and, um, you know, there's a safe enough place to do that. So, Adding to that, when we think about we need the truth, we need community, what are some other things that you see are so essential to a wife's healing process? Oh, um, well, it's, I think just time, time is, is a huge factor. It, it takes, some of it just takes time. And um, I, I think there's a lot of really good resources out there back when it, in 2001 or whatever, I had maybe one or one book to choose from. So now there's women can really pick up a lot of resources. There's online resources. It's, I think a woman today has so many more tools. And then I think for me, counseling, good, good, solid biblical Christian counseling is so, so important because there's certain things you can do in a group that can't be done. Um, on a one-on-one -on -one, really getting to, to some core issues there. A lot of times, listen, we all are, we, we live in a broken world. So we're all package deals. So many of these wives have their own trauma that they, that they perhaps still need right. to, yeah, they need to recover from. And, and, and yeah, just, I think what I learned is to really focus on the people that are authentic and genuine and, um, you begin to you begin to realize that that um, just where to spend your energy, if that makes sense, and making sure that that I'm with people that are that are going to be transparent and honest and tell me tell me hard things, tell me the stuff that I can't see. I think that's the power of of being in a in a in a solid community, not just a social community, but it, with people that really are wanting to, to be on this journey of getting better every day. Well, we've got a few minutes left. And one of the key questions that I wanted to ask you was, um, you know, having dealt with a, a lot of women and helped a lot of women through this process, I know that it's not this clean, linear, you know, journey. Yeah. But what are some key things that you see as markers that you you know that a woman is kind of turning the corner? Like you realize, oh, she's getting it. Oh, yes, there's a, you know, there's the breakthrough. What are some of the key maybe characteristics or attitudes or, or markers that you see in a woman's healing that you can kind of say, now she's, now she's got momentum, now she's moving forward? Yeah, I, the first one is when when she stops obsessing um, over the husband, what he is or isn't doing, and really, really becomes laser focused on what is Christ calling her to do, and it's different for every woman. I mean, I I remember call, crying out to God and saying, "Lord, can I can I divorce this guy?" <laughs> that was kind of what I wanted, and He graciously said, eh. I'm just asking you to wait. I'm not asking you to do this over and over again, but I'm asking you to wait. And I'm so glad I did. Um, for another woman, she sometimes she's holding on to her marriage and it's like a dead animal. And there's the husband's not doing anything, doesn't have any any desire to get better. And so it's like, what is what is God telling you? And but being willing to, to listen. Sometimes Obviously, we want all, every marriage to recover and every family to be whole. If, in a perfect world, we would get that. 
but the reality is I don't I wouldn't want a woman to languish in a relationship in a in a marriage that's technically already dead if that makes sense in other words the covenant's not being upheld and so then so it's it's getting her focus on Christ and then the final phase is and it doesn't happen with everyone some people kind of go through the healing process and then move on but there's that percentage of women that get it and realize wow God can now yeah, use this to help other people. Mm -hmm. And obviously those are the ones we look for, for facilitators. And those, those women really thrive no matter what happens with their husband. They, they thrive because they get it. They're, they're finding their identity in Christ. And that's ultimately what we want for them. Well, and that's one of the, that's one of the key markers we have kind of in the final stage or final process, part of the process is uh, we, we talk about heal, grow, serve. And that last piece of serving, we always tell people, listen, it's not going to look the same for everybody. We're not saying that when you come through this recovery process or you come through this healing process, that you're necessarily going to be serving in that specific area of ministry. But if you have actually gone through a process of healing, if you've gone through a process of recovery and experienced the deep transformative power of the grace of God, how can you not in some way want to be a legacy builder? at a certain point of like, I, I want to invest this good news. I want to invest this incredible grace into other people. So that could be your own children. That yeah. could be, I mean, good grief. I've seen it in my own marriage in terms of the investment my wife has made in me. So even just the way she invests in me as part of her healing is a way that she has shown service. And of course, she's obviously helped a lot of other women too. But uh, nice. we always feel like you haven't, you haven't kind of entered that last joyful stage of healing until you learn to kind of give it all away. Um, and so I appreciate you saying that because I know that that's something that a wife can't get to on day one. That yeah. can't even be in her mindset. Yeah. She is like using the uh, medical analogy, right? She's bleeding out in ICU. <laughs> There's no way she's thinking about how can I lift somebody else up? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do think it's important in the fairly early stages that we plant seeds of a vision that goes beyond where they are. And I think that's why I love what people like you are doing in your ministry is you're allowing your story and allowing what God has done in your life to be the seed of that vision for wives who are going, I can't make it. And you say, I know. And then you can tell them your story. They look at you and go, well, maybe there's some hope. Maybe, maybe, you know, I can take another step. So I appreciate what you're doing. And I would love to give you the last word here to be able to share with folks. How can they get in touch with you, your ministry, your resources? How can we send people your way? Oh, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, we're um, hopeafterbetrayal.com. Pretty much everything you need is on the website. Uh, the book's available on Amazon also. And um, yeah, we have groups locally and then we do groups that meet virtually on the computer via Zoom. And uh, it's amazing. The first time I did it, I thought, I don't know, but it, the women connect, they're in the safety of their own home. So um, it's, that's been growing too. So I yeah. appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to share and, and I'm always glad when there are more workers that are coming to the table because there's plenty of people that need hope and help and, so we're Absolutely. not really, yeah, out there. Yeah, well, thank you for your ministry and thank you for your, your time today too. Thank you, John. And I would just say actually to our listeners too, if, if, if you're a wife out there who's struggling and needing help, absolutely, I'd encourage you to contact Meg and their ministry. But also, if you're a wife out there that's really, maybe something sparked in you when we were talking about that serve piece and talking about actually telling your story and, and helping others, I'd also encourage you to reach out to Meg and maybe God's got in your future being a facilitator to help other wives. So please reach out to, to Meg and their ministry at Hope After Betrayal. And of course, listeners, we're always grateful that you're with us and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. Take care.